So with that, uh, I'm pleased to have a great group of uh, investors with me in this panel. Um, the idea being to help um, you know, the local entrepreneurs and startups and companies uh, kind of understand uh, you know, what, what investors are looking for, um, what values we're putting on companies, um, what kind of uh, things we're looking at right now in terms of themes emerging. Um, and it's great that we have a very international group of people. So I know we have people from uh, Germany, from Bucharest, from London, and from the US. Uh, and maybe just to start with a very quick introduction, uh, maybe a minute. Uh, so I personally, I'm a co-founder and partner at GSV Asset Management, which is a growth-focused asset management firm based in Silicon Valley. Uh, I personally, I'm also based in Europe, so going back and forth a lot. We're looking at mid to late stage private companies and also uh, publicly traded companies generally in three major areas, uh, media, internet, education technology, and um, sustainability, green tech. Maybe each one of you can... Hi, hi guys, I'm Matthias. Uh, I'm with Point9 Capital. It's a Berlin-based early stage tech fund focused on software as a service and digital marketplaces. <coughs> and I'm trying to cover the uh, Eastern European uh, part uh, of the fund. We invest all over the world. Uh, we have been involved with companies like uh, Zendesk or Delivery Hero. And uh, yeah, that's about it. I think we get to know more during the talk probably. Yeah, hi, I'm Jason Ball. Uh, I'm part of Qualcomm Ventures. Qualcomm is the leading wireless chipset company based in San Diego. I'm actually based in London, um, helping with our European investments. We're investing approximately $100 million a year on a global basis. Um, all things mobile, so mobile first, uniquely mobile. Um, business is what we're looking for. My name is Scott Hartley. Uh, for the past three years, I've been a partner at Moore David L Ventures, which is a Sand Hill Road venture firm. Uh, latest fund was $700 million uh, investing across sort of uh, IT on the enterprise side and on the consumer side. Um, but as Steve mentioned, most recently I spent nine months as an innovation fellow uh, at the White House bringing sort of Silicon Valley ideas, uh, basically venture capitalists and startup entrepreneurs coming into Washington to try to infuse new ideas in the ways that um, we can foster more innovation and entrepreneurship across the US. Um, my name is Dan. Uh, I'm based in uh, Bucharest, part of the Early Bird team which is a uh, European uh, VC. Uh, I'm, part of, uh, I'm one of the four partners running a new fund uh, targeting specifically CE and Turkey. We launched uh, the 130 million fund in December. We already made four investments, one of them in Bulgaria. Great. So I wanted to throw out a couple of um, just stats by looking at how quickly technology is changing the world um, how quickly companies are capable of you know, getting out of startup mode and capturing big market shares. Um, so if you look at, for example, um, I don't know if anybody saw, but Mary Meeker yesterday published uh, her latest report. Today we're uploading 1.8 billion pictures a day. Um, you know, in the last two and a half, three years alone, We've been able. We've uploaded more, or we've taken more pictures than in the entire mankind history before that. All this driven by, you know, the smartphones, driven by apps like Instagram. Um, so it's pretty amazing, you know, just on, on in that space. Then you look at uh, Instagram back in uh, 2012 when they sold to Facebook for a billion. Uh, it was an 18 months year old company. Um, at the same time, you had Kodak, which was the leader for decades, uh, going bankrupt you know, at the 200 million market cap. Um, then this morning, one of the presenters um, mentioned WhatsApp you know, is disrupting the entire SMS industry. I would argue the entire communication, cell phone communication industry, um, you know, just with 40 or so people. Um, then you have Snapchat going from zero to almost three billion in less than a year in terms of valuation. Um, so we're, we're actually we're living in these exponential times where everything's moving so fast. Technology is enabling entrepreneurs to, to rise very quickly. Um, so my question to, to each one of you is, so what are the type of companies that you are 
looking at some of the characteristics and some of the things that you're most uh, excited about? Um, we are focused on uh, companies uh, that are uh, doing software or offer software-enabled services. And uh, one thing that, uh, that uh, I think it's important is that you need to keep an, uh, an open mind. Uh, I would never have expected to invest in a consumer-related business coming from the region, but uh, we made one of our first investments in Flips, which is uh, disrupting the TV viewing experience. But uh, this, is, uh, this was unique because it comes from a technology background, having created unique technology for the, for the video streaming uh, market. Uh, so I think what is uh, interesting and what I think is, uh, is relevant for the investment themes is that you need, especially from this region, you need uh, uh, teams that are addressing tough technology uh, uh, problems in a new way. And uh, this was the case with Flips. Uh, we are also seeing uh, interesting opportunities in companies that are twisting existing business models uh, by applying uh, digital technology to existing, uh, existing uh, businesses, large businesses, uh, which was the case with the company that we invested in uh, Romania, which offers <coughs> cross-border recruitment services for blue-collar workers on a temporary basis. So I think uh, the markets here are definitely not structured in the way of trying to chase Teams, uh, the opportunity is there because of the way, uh, the way, the the technology talent is uh, is available in the region. But I would say that this is mostly driven by technology rather than uh, good sales teams that are that are pushing forward uh, uh, solutions and getting early traction. To follow on what Dan said, I think the way that we think about innovation um, in the '90s, people created websites and they brought offline businesses online and I think today as we talked about this morning there's you know mobile which is a new distribution channel into the hands of billions of people there's social which is a new authentication layer of how you trust products there's data which is all the exhaust that you're leaving as you do digitally uh, digital things throughout your day and then there's analytics which is this sort of interpretation of that and really we're seeing these four layers um, start to disrupt all these traditional verticals like you mentioned you know, disrupting retail, disrupting fashion and finance. And so I think taking these new tools and applying them to an old set of problems in a really big market um, and coupled with having a great team, those are sort of the things that, that we generally get excited about. Yeah, so, so us, um, I think we've been pretty fortunate um, being a mobile company. We happen to be sitting at the epicenter of an entire revolution, which we've, we've seen in all the charts. Um, which means we've had some very good successes. Um, we invested into a company called Invincence. Um, that was a billion dollar IPO. It's a, it's a accelerometer probably in a lot of your handsets today. Um, digital security company out of China, NetChan, there's another billion dollar exit for us. And then Waze, which happened last year, another billion dollar exit. Um, so again, we, we happen to be shooting in the crosshairs of the, kind of the perfect place. Um, where we're going next. I mean, we, we made an investment in Fitbit, so you know, personal um, wearable computing is kind of a big big wave that's, that's hitting us as we speak. Um, also, I think education is a huge area. Um, I met a very cool company here yesterday who's doing some innovative things in terms of teaching children how to learn math um, with their hands, so. Yeah, I said it before, we mainly focus on software as a service, so we, we follow the rational software uh, eating the world, basically, and the de democratization of software, meaning making uh, software available for the yeah, mid and long tail of, of companies out there. Um, and then we do stuff in marketplaces, uh, and um, I think on top of that, some topics that we also look at and we find interesting uh, these days is uh, Internet of Things, uh, a bit in, ha in hardware, we also see a lot of stuff happening in, in fintech. Uh, I think the uh, whole financial industry is ripe for disruption, has been very slowly developing recently, and I think there's a lot of opportunities in that space uh, as well. And um, yeah, I think that's, that's mainly it. Yep. 
And I agree with Jason that um, you know education technology specifically right now is booming. Uh, the education space is probably one of the least industries that has seen disruption by technology, um, and there is probably the biggest opportunity you know compared to healthcare, which is already gone well, through the. Fundamentally, we all end up going to school, right? Exactly. So target market everybody. Exactly, and if you look at how quickly and fast things are changing. Uh, this old model where you basically go to school and then you go to work does, it, it, it doesn't exist anymore. We're all students because things are changing so quickly. Um, you have to adapt to the new technologies, you have to adapt to the new circumstances, and uh, it's an ongoing process. So, I mean, it's that, and you know, children are growing up digital, right? I had my first computer when I was, I don't know, 19 maybe. Now you see a two year old playing with an iPad, and you're like, wow, you're a better gamer than I am. <laughs> you know? One of the really cool things about you know, launching with uh, being constrained by platforms and not by geography is that if I look at my smartphone or the supercomputer in my pocket, I've got QuizUp, which is a Sequoia-backed Icelandic, uh, basically, uh, gaming slash education company. I've got Skype, I've got Spotify, I've got SoundCloud. And these are all you know, companies that came out of Berlin and Stockholm and Estonia and, and, and Iceland and pretty small places where they were constrained not, not by where they came from, but by the fact that they launched on iOS or on Android. Yeah, yeah. we actually have one company in the portfolio which is called Brainly. They're actually from, from Poland, so from the CE region. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a homework help network for students, K-12. And it's pretty much going into that direction. And we have another company also in, uh, in the States that is uh, basically about uh, digitalizing the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, bringing everything on, on, on mobile devices. I think that's a, that's a big trend, definitely. Yeah. I think that uh, it's interesting that uh, the way <coughs> uh, the way, uh, world is opening up is uh, actually creating a boom effect, because uh, you don't have, uh, for example, people in Africa going through punch cards in order to arrive at uh, mobiles. They jump all the way uh, to the mobiles in the first place. And it's pretty much the same thing with the uh, traditional industries, which are being uh, rethought of uh, by people in uh, new markets. Uh, people in uh, Eastern Europe are rethinking logistics for Western European uh, companies. Uh, people uh, that uh, in Turkey are rethinking uh, the way cloud infrastructure software should be uh, should be written. All these are, I think, examples that are encu are encouraging investors like ourselves to to come and be more active in the in the region and should also encourage people from the region to, to, to look for capital and think of their ideas, not in terms of local markets, but global markets as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so when, I mean, all of you see a lot of management teams, startups all the time, um, you see a lot of ideas. Um, the next question will be, when somebody comes, uh, you know, pitches to you, presents their idea, what, what are kind of the key things that you're looking at. I mean, just from, from um, our end, the GSV, we have our own, four, we call it the 4P formula, people, product, potential predictability, the first P being the most important one with people, so we really look for um, best uh, top management teams, very uh, strong believers, um, long-term view, um, high quality, people, so what are some of the things that uh, you guys look at when uh, companies present? I think for us it's, it's, it's pretty much the same, um, but uh, with a slight differentiation that we actually have also a lot of uh, benchmarks, I think due to the f clear focus we have on, on SaaS, uh, so we like to look at numbers uh, as well, but uh, numbers obviously are, are not everything at the end of the day, so it's, it's very much about team especially when you're in early stage, there's not that much to look at. Mm -hmm. So uh, team plays obviously a, a, a very important role in that regard. Yeah, I think we're going to end up saying the same thing, every yeah. last one of us, but yeah. my three Ps of investing, people, product, potential. So great, great team, a product that I absolutely love, um, and the belief that it can be a billion dollar, if not a billion dollar plus company. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and it was going to go, yep, yep, I'll take some of that, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe, maybe to add to that, obviously you need to be very uh, risk open and, and kind of also being uh, open that you might fail given, you know, it's a startup and early stage. 
how do you see that? I mean, there is a big difference, or at least I see that, between entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley versus entrepreneurs in Europe. Uh, just the mindset and the culture is different. And in, you know, in Silicon Valley, nobody's afraid to fail. Here, it's a little bit of a different uh, situation given that there's a lack, less access to capital, a different mindset. How do you see that? Yeah, as you say, I, so I think access to the capital is one of the defining um, parts of that. There are large rounds that are happening in the US, and I definitely don't want to take, take steam from US investors. Um, so you have more runway to experiment or reposition the business if you do make a mistake. In a capital-constrained environment, which you see a lot in Europe, you know, if you've got 250K, 500K round that you've raised, you, you just you don't have enough time to, to reposition and rework a business if things don't pan out like you thought initially. And I don't know about you guys, but I, you know, most of the business plans I get, this is what we're going to do, yeah, and that's what we're doing when we sell the company. Mm -hmm. So if, if you don't have that, that runway to, to get there, you're, you're going to fail inevitably. Yes, I was going to say something very similar, which was um, basically, you know, I think one of the other things, in addition to team and technology and market and the deal, it's, it's how are you going to de-risk this investment? And so from the in investor standpoint, it's thinking about what's, you know, what's your hiring plan? What's your burn rate going forward? How much are you raising and how much runway is that going to give you? And if that's going to give you 18 to 24 months of runway, then really what this is about is testing a hypothesis, getting a bunch of data back, measuring, monitoring, and then pivoting within this window of what you say you're going to do and, and what you ultimately do. But it's really about sort of managing that risk. So I think failure is sort of a spectrum. It's not that things launch and then they fail. It's like they launch and they have two years of runway and they measure everything and they get all the data back and they meet frequently with their investors. And then hopefully you iterate towards something that works rather than something that fails, but you can't always can't always win. Um, I think what's uh, particular about uh, the region is that uh, there is ob an obvious lack of uh, investment capital available, which somehow changes the dy dynamics of the, of the process. And for me, uh, the most interesting companies are not the ones that are coming to me to pitch, uh, but the ones that I have to pitch to. Most, uh, the most interesting prospects I have now are actually companies that are not in fundraising or official fundraising because they are either bootstrapped, not active on the local market, don't, not interested in uh, or not aware of, uh, of the investors. Actually had a chat with, uh, with a guy that uh, runs a very successful company and uh, he asked for my CV, which is quite interesting, uh, quite an interesting <laughs> approach. But it's the right, it's the right thing to, to do. And what I'm looking for in this guy is for his ability to listen and actually understand what I need from him in order to become successful. Because mm -hmm. if I have deep technology guys that are focused on the product and think that the product will change the world and are not willing to listen to the business advice, that's not the ideal match for me. So just, just to pick up on that for a second, because it's, it's a point that gets glossed over. If you're raising money from someone, you're going to be working with them for many, many, many years do due diligence on your investors, pick up the phone, talk to their portfolio companies, don't, don't even tell them you're doing this, just do it. And they'll, you can find out really what they're like after the check goes in. Um, can avoid a lot of tears and pain. <laughs> and what is your stand on um, you know, copycats? Because you know, we're in markets like in Europe where you see something, uh, a new type of model, like Groupon came out in the US, and then you know, there were 50 other countries that copycats emerged doing the same thing. Um, is that something that we could, and, and I mean, just from what I'm seeing, and I would assume Bulgaria, there is many uh, entrepreneurs who you know, see an idea that's working somewhere else, and then they try to pick it up and apply it here because it doesn't exist here. What is, and so what is your view on those type of companies? For me, if, I, if I may start, yeah. because we, I think we have a, we have a couple of examples uh, here. Uh, I don't think that copycats, mm, mm, putting somebody in the category of copycats it is easy, because just by taking an idea or a business model, you cannot assume that you are going to be successful. There were hundreds, thousands of Groupon copycats, and I'm not aware of any single one that became a huge success as well. 
just like uh, we invested uh, in Turkey in a company called Metrecare that is, was built for ease of uh, communication as the Zillow of Turkey. But the Turkish real estate market is actually something which is quite specific and you, there are already large players in the market that are successful. And, but we made, uh, we, we judged that there is opportunity for a different type of player that, that, comes, to, that comes to the market. So being, having something that is already existing and doing it in the same sector with some th uh, somehow similar model doesn't mean, doesn't, shouldn't qualify you as a, as a copycat. Facebook was not a MySpace copycat. Right? I would say, I mean, really focus on a problem that is a heart attack rather than a headache. So if you think it's a marginal iteration on something that already exists, you're better off taking, you know, taking a month off, really thinking about an industry that's different, thinking totally outside the box. Um, a good friend of mine uh, who's from Pakistan, he left a big venture firm recently to start a trucking company. And it's literally, it's not a trucking company in the sense, but it's a mobile-enabled optimization of trucking routes. And to me, that's interesting because it's so radically different than another photo sharing app. So really taking you know, the skill set and the mobile and the social and, and the data and the analytics and the things that, that, we can, that we think about and know about and then applying them, partnering with somebody who it comes from an industry that's massive and that hasn't been disrupted yet, I think is a, is a better play than trying to iterate around the margin of something that's already been created. Yeah, I think kind of generally speaking, I'm not a fan of copycat businesses at all. Um, I, I think it can be kind of destructive in, in some senses. That said, um, because we have a global footprint, uh, I'm lucky enough to get to look at our deal flow in China, India, Korea, Brazil, et cetera. Um, and what, what I've seen in those regions is, uh, case in point, uh, Korea, you know, we're, we're looking at um, a very simple delivery business, uh, kind of in line with uh, the, um, the, the Uber service that's happening in New York. But it's something that's predicated specifically on kind of Korean dynamics and Korean market need. Is it going to be a billion dollar company? No, but we'll price the investment accordingly. And it's something that's kind of built by and for that particular market. Um, and I think that there's great, kind of great scope for that or you know, go, go for the big end, one, one of the two. Maybe depends on, on business models a little bit. If it's a marketplace, it's usually a regional play. So you need to go market by market. Mm -hmm. If that's a copycat, I think that's fine because you need to do these um, kind of local adjustments and adaptions. If it's a SaaS or a software, it's usually global right from the start. So then we wouldn't look into like some copycat of an existing solution. So I think, um, uh, yeah, I think the, and the most disruptive companies uh, aren't copycats. Yep. Yeah, and looking at it uh, on the flip side, typically when you have a big problem, um, there's a big opportunity. And if you look at some of the very successful a um, couple of examples, very successful startups that have emerged as uh, large leaders lately. Uh, you look at Airbnb, you look at Lyft, um, you know, which we're an investor in. Um, you look at some of those models where there was a necessity for just a better product, um, for you know, the sharing economy where people have something, can make money out of it, but there was nothing available before that where they can actually utilize that. Uh, and now, you know, there's a startup seeing this niche, this opening, the, uh, you know, and creating an amazing product for that. So I think one, one thing that um, is appealing, you know, specifically in Eastern Europe and Bulgaria, um, there's obviously a lot of problems. Um, and with that, there's a lot of opportunities. And I think that, um, you know, having um, startups and entrepreneurs trying to solve those is very, very important to drive economic growth uh, and to drive the, the well-being of the country as a total. It's true, but the question is if that makes up for a VC case, if you just would, if you would just consider these economies here. Mm. Well, I mean, as, like I said, for the Korea example, yeah. I think as long as the investment numbers work, it works. I mean, you're, you're not going to have to write a, a multi-hundred million dollar check yeah, for some of these businesses. For every investment we do, we would say that it at least needs to pay back the entire fund. It, least has to, it needs to have the potential. Yeah. Okay. So, 
I probably wouldn't do that. So we would. We are obviously investing You're into companies. You're a bad companies. local investor. <laughs> Write small checks that don't pay back the fund. <laughs> that first 250k check. Come on. <laughs> no, but I mean that it doesn't have to mean because you can still invest into a Bulgarian company that obviously has uh, global or international ambitions. And, and that's actually the point. I think we are investing into Latvian companies, into Polish companies, into Fr French companies, and so on. But they all have international ambitions. And then we help them with that. We don't tell them they have to go to the US. 50% of the software market is in the US. But, and it probably makes sense to go there at some point. But um, maybe just internationalize in, in, in Europe in the first step go after uh, some, some bigger markets, but still keep the benefits of coming from uh, Bulgaria, have great talent here, have uh, com relatively uh, cheap talent available. I mean, those are all benefits that uh, you should uh, keep and, and take into account, but then use this and, and, and grow beyond that and maybe open up additional off offices and so on. That's what basically um, at least the companies we have invested in from Europe um, are doing or have done already. Yep. So, I mean, I think one thing to keep in mind for the entrepreneurs in the room, as you pitch to investors and as you look for the right investors for you, you know, as was mentioned before, it's a partnership, number one. This is something that's, you know, five, five year plus uh, commit, committed relationship. And the second thing is to look at uh, the thesis and the portfolio of the investor. You know, if you look at um, for any of us up here, you know, you can't really boil the ocean, so to speak. There are thousands and thousands of startups out there. So typically, based on the size of the fund, based on sort of the sweet spot of the partnership and what they think they're, they're somewhat good at, and the way that they've positioned um, their investment thesis to their limited partners who gave them the money to invest, um, they're c somewhat constrained around their thesis and around the size of the check that they can write. And so before you go and, and try to pitch everyone on the planet, you know, look specifically at the, the part of the pipeline where you, you know, if you're an early stage company, you pitch to early stage funds that are smaller, that can write the smaller checks, um, and then pitch to, to partners that you think um, could really be uh, looking in the thesis of, of the area and the problem that you're trying to solve. Yeah, I think we, we try to be, bi uh, we, we tend to be biased towards large businesses that would make an impact or return the, fan, uh, the fund. But uh, I see a lot, of, uh, a lot of interesting ideas that are just wasting their time trying to raise money from uh, international VCs. Mm. If you mm. want to build a five to $10 million company, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong, but you are, if you are pitching an international VC, you are wasting your time and his time. So you should focus on local sources of funding, which, uh, and these local sources of funding are becoming more and more democratic. They, they become available. I think uh, 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 funds like Launch Hub and Eleven made a significant impact in, uh, in Bulgaria. Most probably the model will try to be copied in uh, other markets uh, in the region. They, they are bound to have a positive economic impact uh, in, uh, in each, of the, each of these countries. Of course, but you need to put in perspective what the, what the size of your investor with the size of the opportunity you are, you are offering. I think the reality of the situation is when you're thinking about international investors, I, mean, I spend a lot of time on planes. I know everyone in security line and at Heathrow by name. Um, you, you go into a region, you get to know the, the, the local investors there, and I end up writing checks for kind of Series B stage companies. Um, as I get to know the region better, then I'll start moving down the Series A and, and seed investments. But kind of as a first step, I think most international, mm -hmm. guys, especially U.S. investors, they're only going to come in very late in the process. So your options are either raise local money or get up and leave and raise money somewhere else. Um, get, getting a, a guy to fly in from Sand Hill Road and write you a check, is, that's, that's kind of a pipe. Well, it's not a pipe dream, but ch challenging at best. Um, Actually, the, the, uh, it's interesting that uh, there are these type of... Uh, trips to, to see U.S. investors, which create the, exactly the wrong type of engagement because you have teams that are going to U.S., uh, getting 5, 10, 15 uh, meetings. They say, we met everybody out of 15, three said that they are interested, and all of a sudden they think uh, they made it to, to U.S. But then they realize that the level of interest already vanished by the time they, they left the room. 
and they miss on, in, on interesting opportunities to fund locally because of that. Yeah, I think one of, the, one of the opportunities there is kind of get on a plane, you, you can go to London. Um, so initiatives like Seed Camp, fantastic. We've been a supporter there for, for, for years. Um, and they've really done a great job at helping emerging entrepreneurs and emerging economies kind of establish a footprint and actually get rolling if Reshma's in the crowd. Yeah, I, mean, I think I heard a yeah in the back, <laughs> yay. And I would add two positive trends that uh, are becoming obvious over the last couple of years. You have a lot of the bigger uh, US VC firms actually focusing more and more on Europe, just given the example of big, you know, global leading companies like Spotify, like uh, King.com, like uh, Supercell, that's still suddenly coming out of, uh, you know, of Europe. Uh, the Fina mentioned there's many examples out of Israel um, in the last couple of years. And also another uh, positive for entrepreneurs is they can now utilize platforms like a Kickstarter, like um, um, AngelList, um, you know, that are there, that if you have a appealing enough idea, you can actually raise money, startup money, uh, you know, very easily. I think what's, what's, what's happening and it's going to happen more and more is that uh, there will be partnerships between European VCs and US VCs in which you have co-investments done, uh, done by large US VCs with European uh, uh, investors that already have exposure to the to the um, uh, to the region can uh, can bring good opportunities to, uh, to to the others. If you look at the portfolio of uh, of uh, early bird, we made investments in the last year and a half with USV, with Sequoia, with Index, all these in European companies. But if you look at these, it's, they came in quite late stage, right? Yes, so exactly. I mean, I think that's what you just, you just point, said. Yeah. I think. It doesn't make sense uh, when you're raising seed, Series A, whatever. Even Series B is probably still too early to go out and raise from uh, from from American VCs. I mean, it all depends on the on the individual case. But um, I think that the aim is uh, at, at least for us, and if it makes sense, that we uh, try to come in and then help those guys attract those kind of top-notch, larger investors from the U.S. But in most cases, they they actually requ require to have some sort of presence in the US, like either uh, do sales in the US or uh, you, you, ha you have a country manager there, you have a sales team there, and if in most cases, if they decide to invest, you, you have to do a flip anyhow at some point. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, and, and I think that's still the, uh, the thinking, the way of thinking in, uh, in the US and from US investors. And I, I don't think that will change so quickly. I disagree, I think this is, <laughs> this is already in process. Yeah. And I think U.S. investors, as they, as they make more and more uh, investments outside of U.S., will become more and more comfort, uh, comfortable with companies that are not U.S.-centric or about to become U.S.-centric. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's the mm -hmm. same thing. Becoming more comfortable with investment partners that you know and trust very well in a, in a region. Because getting mm -hmm. on a plane for a board meeting from, from the West Coast it's terrible. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I have to get on a plane and fly up to Helsinki and it's a three hour trip, I'm oh, three hours on a plane from, the, from the West Coast. It's yes. also relatively small tickets from, from their perspective, right? The, the checks they're writing here in Europe, I would say most of them, they are still comparably small to what they invest in uh, or what kind of checks they write in the US. So it's still more like checking out the ground, what's happening than really like doing a or putting a lot of money on Europe, I would say. When you when you look at you know, just the mechanics of like how do you manage risk as a as a portfolio manager, you think about early stage mm -hmm. uh, early stage companies are the highest risk. So mm -hmm. what's the way you offset high risk investments? Is you do a lot of them, and if you're doing a lot of investments in a particular geography, you've got to be close to that geography. Yeah. And so, angel investment, and seed investment is like inherently a local game, and so it's. It's got to be not just the flights and stuff, but just from a risk management standpoint. You're probably going to look for local, you know, local capital first, and then you go to London and, you know, and talk to these guys and, and go to Seed Camp, and then you know, be on some sort of stage where the risk makes sense and the flights make sense and that sort of thing. Then you're kind of opened up to the to the global markets. But I think just from a risk management standpoint, it's interesting that angel investment is is almost always local, and uh, I've seen that you know, true in, in, in Africa to Southeast Asia to, to Eastern Europe. And then, you know, I, th I think there is a, a time when, as these guys mentioned, to move your sales team, move yeah. your biz dev team to 
New York or San Francisco. And I think a great example of that in San Francisco is Prezi, which is a Hungarian startup that raised capital. And I think if you asked 100 Americans today where that company was from, they would probably say San Francisco. They'd have no idea where it's from um, because they've, they've done such a good job of just sort of integrating the great, beautiful product, um, raised local capital, it's kind of scaled up, moved, moved to San Francisco, continued to raise more international capital. And I think, you know, a great example of a company from the region. Yeah, Zendesk is uh, probably yeah. a similar uh, example, yeah. Yep. Um, I think we have time for uh, one or two questions from the audience. Hey I would just I would just ask real quick that you guys make it quick because we're running a little behind. So, quick questions, quick short answers, please. Okay. So uh, first, I want to say it was a great talk, uh, and uh, I want to ask you about the subject that uh, you briefly talked about, and it's uh, the new trend of uh, wearable technologies. Uh, Apple is rumored to release uh, something like an iWatch or something this year. Uh, Samsung is pumping out all sorts of such devices and uh, do you think it's now worth investing in wearable technologies and apps for it? And uh, what are the qualities of a successful startup in, in, the, in that field? Yeah, just very quickly, we are absolute believers in that. You have Pebble, you have uh, Jawbone, Fitbit, um, um, you know, we're believers in those and I think more and more is going to be important about the data it collects, what you're doing and uh, to analyze it. Yeah, so, since I mentioned Fitbit earlier, um, so we, we've definitely written a check there. Um, and as far as the uh, kind of uh, the parent company Qualcomm, I mean, we're, we're involved in the Android Wear project which was announced recently. So I think wearables and kind of distributed computing in that sense is, is a huge wave that's coming. Yeah, I think the, the whole technology, as we was mentioned earlier um, on stage, you know, kind of moving into the background. And I think one of the areas that, that I'm really excited about is the interaction of the smartphone in your, in your pocket with the built environment around you and how you start interacting you know, from analog to digital and how the, the world around us and the built environment becomes more digital. We are not seeing a lot of things coming uh, out of the region in uh, wearable computing, so I'm, I mean, I'm open to that, but uh, it's not, <laughs> it's not, I'm not losing sleep over it. No, we're both here. Pavel had a quick question. Yeah, quick yeah, one. one for Jason. Jason, this is your second year coming back here, right? Yes. Why? Why? <laughs> Be because you invited me and are so nice. <laughs> we kick butt, Jason, because um, Bulgaria rocks. Yeah, because Bulgaria rocks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, this is, I mean, this is great. Come on, this is probably twice the size of what it was last year. Um, the lineup was much better, excluding me, of course. Um, yeah, great to be back. Hi, I'm Mari from Finland, the country of Supercell and Angry Birds, but I'm currently staying in Sofia. And speaking about location, what is your advice since I'm uh, establishing my second startup company? Whether to establish in here in Bulgaria or in Finland, where the expenses are, are high, but also public uh, funding available, or in London? Okay, good question. Where, come, to, where come, to start? Finland, London, Berlin. Bulgaria. Come to Berlin. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> yeah. Jason, what do you think? Um, I'm a huge fan of Tekis. Uh, for those that don't know Tekis, it's a government-supported uh, funding program that fin Finland offers. Uh, they offer kind of equity-free cash grants to businesses. Hu huge fan of that program, so it's really great. Scott? I, I spoke to an entrepreneur a couple years ago in Beijing, and I asked him, what is an entrepreneur? And he told me, it's somebody who hates weekends. <laughs> and I asked him what he meant by that, and he said, in China, the competition is so fierce that you don't dare take a weekend or someone else is going to copy your business and, and, and make you redundant. So I do think being in an environment where you've got real pressure and the ability to, to tap into local expertise is really important. So whatever that means for you and your industry, if that's in London or in Helsinki or if it's here in Sofia. Yeah, I think it's uh, important to profile the type of company you want to build. If it's tech heavy, most probably it makes sense to come here. If you need a lot of sales and marketing effort, I don't think you will find enough relevant people in, uh, in the region. 
but ideally you should combine you, sh you should combine different uh, different markets all right and with that everybody we'd like to thank the panel i have an announcement to make but first uh, let's give a big hand up thank you Ooh, thanks guys